Good morning, dear member of the Luxembourg uh, industry ecosystem, dear neighbors from the greater region and from the rest of Europe, dear solution providers, welcome. Welcome to this new episode of the DH Talk, addressing the digital transformation in an industry for zero context. My name is Arno Lambert. I'm the director of the Luxembourg Digital Innovation Hub, and I will be your host today. Um, for the ones not yet familiar with the DH, uh, let me start first by introducing what we do. Um, we are actually uh, a one-stop shop for the industry, um, helping accelerating digital transformation of the industry here in Luxembourg. And for that, we are a hub, meaning we put in relation the different industry needs with the different suppliers that have solutions, potential also uh, university and research entities, as well as financing options. We are part of Lux Innovation, the National Innovation Agency, but we are actually a partnership with the Federation, FIDIL, Federation of Industry Luxembourg, the Chamber of Commerce, the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, the University of Luxembourg, and the Fonds National de la Recherche. So we are here today to um, discuss interesting topic on industry for the zero, but before we jump into that, let me go uh, and start with some housekeeping. Um, you, as you can see on the right hand side, you have of the platform, you have different buttons or tabs. You have the chats in which I welcome you to interact between yourself or with the speakers. You can use that uh, at the same, but if you want to ask a questions to the speaker or so to myself, please use the questions tab. The chats would be more for interacting. The questions will be the one that we'll be looking through the webinar to see when we're going to know the interacting part. Um, at the end of the seminar, uh, looking and making sure we address your questions. You're going also to have on the right hand side of that a polls um, tab in which we're going to ask you to look there for the polls we're going to have during the session. Thank you already for, for looking at those ones. Um, please note that this session here is recorded for the purpose that you can therefore also rewatch it and replay it if you want, but also for future uh, audience that in the end could not attend, so they will be able to uh, report and so it replay the sessions. This is the housekeeping. So moving on, um, <clears throat> industry for the zero and the digital transformation, and for the one that had already the pleasure to be with us in previous sessions. And um, it's it's a key evolution of the industry and, and another revolution of the industry. And the key aspects of that revolution, it's clearly about the element of digital, is about being smart and being connected. And this is ahead of further evolution of what we call digital ecosystem, in which Indian supply chain and manufacturing definitely do not work anymore alone, but in a full ecosystem that between the physical and the digital. But what the scope of its of digital transformation landscape is actually the end-to-end -end process of, of an industry. It starts with the relationship with a customer, and that's actually a topic we have addressed in the previous webinar. Today, we're going to address the supplier side and how the relationship and utilization of the supplier's interaction is actually changing the evolution on and the opportunities we can have in the digital transformation. In the next webinar that will take place on the 24th of June, we will be addressing the center part, which is the production side. And you probably will see in your screen, you have already a call for registering. And feel free to do it now or feel free to do it in a later stage. To address um, those uh, specific topics, I have the pleasure uh, to uh, welcome uh, some guests that I will introduce now. Um, we have the pleasure to welcome Stefan Grenz, who is the Director of Manufacturing Supply Chain Management at IEE. Thank you, Stefan, for joining us. And we have also uh, Kristen Wilhelm, the CEO and founder of Shipstar. Two strong actors here that will share their experience in digital transformation. And before I leave them the floor, let's first go into a first poll. We are discussing about suppliers. So I think the key question to you, audience, is just to be able also to tune from our interaction here to see how many suppliers you have. Are, do you have one to 50 suppliers? Do you have 51 to 250? Or do you have even more of that? So 
If you could um, take the best guess or the actual number you have, so you went to the poll section and you have the different options, and please select the most appropriate one and submit vote. And we are going to look at that in a second. While you are voting, let me uh, address one topic. IBM made a study uh, some years ago, and they came a very large scale study, and they came with this impressive, I would say, statement. Up to 65% of the value of a company's product and services is derived from its supplier. Meaning in an industry for the zero context, in the supply chain and the digital supply chain, that takes a, a, a tremendous importance considering that this will going to further accelerate and the importance of the relationship with the supplier is key. Hence the, top, the, the topic of this, uh, this episode being from supplier to digital partner. And here we can see from the poll that the majority of you have actually a limited number, if I may say, but a limited number of trusted suppliers. So what does it make to actually digitize that relation? And this is where now from this pure certain facts and numbers, I am to leave the floor to Stefan that's going to share his experience of transformation on the supplier side uh, for um, IEE. So Stefan, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello, well, good morning to everybody. And uh, thank you to Arnaud for the, uh, for the introduction. So I'm speaking today for for IE, our experience, and uh, yeah, what what we have done and where we are today. Um, maybe first uh, for those who have um, not heard about IE yet. So IE is a rather young company. So it was founded about 30 years as a startup uh, here in uh, Luxembourg. Um, we are an engineering and manufacturing company, mainly um, towards automotive industry. And uh, as you can see here on the map, so meanwhile, after the 30 years, we are a global player in the automotive uh, industry with um, yeah, plants and uh, sales and R&D offices around the globe. Um, as I already mentioned, um, just to give you a quick overview what IE is doing. So as I said, we are in the, in the automotive. Um, we are mainly, and, uh, mainly in the uh, interior sensing. We are developing sensing, sensing solutions. Um, and more or less all of them um, are in the safety, so which will um, secure and save um, the drivers and uh, passengers um, life. So there's one example I'm, I'm usually trying to take because more or less everybody of you will know that. So it's so-called a seatbelt reminder. So if you're not buckling up in your car and the noise is going on, so that's us. <laughs> um, okay. But um, we have 10 minutes, so I, I will go pretty fast to, to the topic itself. So we are talking today about um, yeah, the digital supplier, but some key facts about um, where we are coming from and what our, what, what, what our intention or what is the reason why we are going in this direction. Um, we have far more about 150 suppliers meanwhile. So we are managing 4,000 employees worldwide. Um, we have above 700 customers to manage. And all of this will, will lead end of the day to more than 150 inbound and outbound shipments. So I'm pretty fast um, here the question will come up, okay, how to deal with, uh, with all the demands of the different customers, how to deal with the suppliers, um, keeping track, keep, keeping quality, keeping documentation on, on, on track. And as well, with, uh, if you're talking as you have seen about the global, global landscape, how to get this over time zones and um, yeah, over many even internal um, organizations. So, and this is, let's say, this is the base where we started a couple of years ago and said, okay, we need to get this better under control, um, not to rely too much on individuals and to get systems in place when the customers and suppliers. And for us, I'm talking here now as both. I'm talking as a, as a supplier for the, for the OEMs, as a tier one, tier 1.5. And as well, I'm talking about a customer with a, with a quite huge uh, supplier base. So a, qu a quick draw on, 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 uh, on our setup uh, towards the supplier. And for sure, we could debate here on hours on all the different systems and solutions that are implemented. But I would focus here mainly on two. I, I call them, well, that's, 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 that's a phrase, on an on EDI communication system, and as well on, on a web-based um, supplier or customer portals. 
um, yeah, EDI, electronic data interchange. Uh, so we are using this or implemented this towards our customers and back to our suppliers to avoid. And uh, if I remember back uh, even five to eight years ago, so all, all the data were coming by email, per mail, per phone. And we had people sitting there around, we are typing in data into the SAP system to get our MRP run um, possible and to get then the demands towards our suppliers. So what was done today, where we are today, all the data are transferred uh, digital to the systems in a, in a regular run and transferred after the MRP run in our system directly to, to the supplier. So we have really fast reaction times. It's um, um, pretty good traceability. You have a history of the data, you can analyze the data. So all this sounds for the moment perfect. Um, but also on the other hand, so we, we, we are managing our suppliers, we are managed by our customers. So we implemented tools, interface, web interfaces, um, B2P interfaces where all the documentations are stored, where um, AD claims, quality handlings, uh, supplier ratings, audit follow-ups, specification exchange, and data storage is managed on a page which is accessible by everybody. So also here, it stops pretty fast and immediately to get into the discussions by email, but I, I called uh, this person, this person is not with us anymore. I, I had to send emails and phone calls and so on. And as well, the excuses, I have never received the information. So all this is for the moment, for the moment gone. So this is towards our customers and as well as established towards our suppliers. But yeah, as, as I said, all this sounds pretty good. And this is the, the, the theory behind which um, in, in general is also working, but there's always a big but. If we are going to, um, to the B2B interfaces, so, and, and as usual, customer is king. What means customer is deciding what to do and which portal to use, which interface to use. And as you, if you remember from, from the key facts I have just shown you before, we are dealing with more than 700 customers, means uh, we have also to deal with a couple of hundred different customer interfaces and uh, B2B portals. In general, the system is still fine, but and this is a real constraint and, and a real world, world experience that end of the day, it's, it, it's not that standard anymore. And it's not that you really get into uh, one portal and you can deal with everything. You have a portal per customer, in this case per customer, um, which, which brings high complexity and also which brings um, yeah, a need of, 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 of more headcount and more resources than, than you initially planned for it. Nevertheless, all the advantages will remain. You keep the traceability, you have high transparency, you have, uh, it's easy to involve all your own organization around the world. And um, you have one communication platform and for sure, that's also a big advantage, no loss of data. But what I would like to point out here is, and, that, and that's the point, even on the supplier base, as we are acting on, uh, as in this case, as well as, as customer, a one fits all solution, even on the supplier base is almost impossible. And there are several reasons for it. There are reasons for that they are not able to, to, to access the systems. They don't want to, they have not the, the capabilities, or even they are using different systems and just didn't, uh, do not um, yeah, agree on, 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 on what we are asking. Good. As well, um, on, the, on the EDI side, or I call it EDI and MRP side in this case, I, I would even say up to last year, I, I wouldn't complain about the system at all. Okay, there are many known, um, let's say, obstacles and, uh, and disadvantages of those systems. Um, uh, like, like that you need a continuous improvement of your systems, you have high effort to It looks like we just lost our speaker, Stefan. Um, so um, that might unfortunately happen. And, uh, we are live, so um, I'm just going to, we still have his slide, so I'm probably going to come back to him or leave him 30 seconds to join back. I just want to uh, highlight already two things that uh, we can take from his message is that uh, we are on the one hand side the supplier and the customer from somebody else so it's uh, it's always we have always those two roles that we want to bring in and here is stefan back on stage with us so i was okay. just highlighting while you were reconnecting the fact that one of the key messages you, you came across was to say that 
we are on one side the customer of somebody and the supplier of somebody else. And there are certain same game for certain matters, but different games for other matters. So I'll give you back the floor to continue. Okay. So and and, and then um, I hope you still got that. So as I said, there's there's a lot of, of, of known disadvantages out about this system, but a lot of advantages. And as I said, just before the, the component crisis on the automotive side for, for, for the chip market and as well the COVID pandemic, um, I would say the system is very great, working great and it's, uh, it's, it's the best what, what we can do. But now in the, in the crisis, you really discovered the weaknesses as well of the system. So if, if your customers are ordering and ordering and you have the, the supply chain is empty, so the system is full of data, but you cannot really set priorities anymore. And end of the day, you're then really happy to step in once again with the human being grabbing a phone and get into discussion and, uh, and, and, and do your planning for sure together with the digital tools, but to, to, to be able to, to manage and to run your MRPs um, manually. And, and this is something which, which I want to point out here, which is important. It's not about only the systems. You need also the people who are staying behind and know what the system is doing. And um, that, that's uh, one, one important message here, what, what we experienced and uh, what we lived uh, with, an, with an ID. Here, I'm already at my end of my presentation. Thank you very much that I could introduce some of ex the experience that we had with those two systems, uh, which were implemented. And um, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Stefan. And, uh, and before uh, we we'll, we'll get, uh, we we'll leave the floor to Christian to, to bring a, a, a further perspective on that. I think you, you, one message was was key. You, you said that okay, digitizing is fine, it works, but in the end, doesn't you still need the people? Uh, that's I think a strong message here. It doesn't mean that uh, you do it with other people. It's a combination of both. Um, I mean, if you had to do it again. Uh, that, that, that uh, if you had to take one big lesson about how you have implemented so far, what is the key one if you had to do it again? Would you do that differently? Um, no, no. I, I would say um, that the way we have done it uh, is, 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 is okay, and I'm really happy with, with the results, but I, would, I wouldn't, um, wouldn't put the expectations that high, let's say, because there is, as I said, there's always a but. And uh, it's not always that easy that the PowerPoint is showing everybody. And uh, if, if the consultants and everybody is coming, hey, it's super easy and nice, and you, have, you don't need anybody anymore, but that's not, not true. So for sure, you need less in operation. You need you have no manual data input anymore, and everything is fine. But as well, you need the people who understand the data, because what happens, and this is uh, also something of the real life, the feedback out of your organization is, I have my data. I don't question my data anymore because they are in the system. And if you do the manual input, if you're in, in contact with your, with your customer or supplier, you are questioning what you are typing in and you will also recognize mistakes. And that's, um, that, that's the only thing I, I would give out here as message. I don't put the expectation too high. A good tools, helpful tools, they are making your life easier, but don't believe um, that they can do everything for you. You have you need to people who think about what the system is doing in the background. Thank you, Stefan. I mean, uh, we'll definitely come back into the, the panel discussion uh, after Christian. Now, I mean, uh, I want to introduce uh, Christian, um, that is CEO and founder of uh, Shipstar. And here, I mean, uh, in the supplier and the customer relationship, there are also platforms that develop themselves to further basically help that transformation. And uh, Christian, floor is yours. Highlight us on, on the platform side uh, and, and the audience, what that can do to help the different the industry. Yeah, thanks, Anna. So welcome, everyone. Uh, so first of all, um, many thanks for your interest and, and time. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here with you today. So I'm Christian. I'm the founder and CEO of Shipstar. So I worked my entire life in logistics and before I started my own venture at Chipster, I was a global logistic procurement manager at Kuno Nagel. So for more than eight and a half years and Kuno Nagel, as you know, is one of the biggest or the biggest air freight and sea freight freight forward in the world. I worked, I worked in the, in the 4PL integrated uh, division and I was in, in charge of optimizing global supply chain of some of the largest clients at Kuno Nagel. 
So from various industries, such as high-tech, uh, pharma, automotive, and many, many more. So in 2015, especially, I saw that digitalization reshaped already other business industries, booking.com, Airbnb, etc. And I was really, really wondering why there's no platform in the massive industry of logistic procurement. So at Kühnenagel, tried out various portals and other solutions, of course, but none of the solutions provide me the same user experience, automatization, and especially efficiency that some well-known booking and optimization platforms provide in other industries. So in this, what let me create Chipster. So I want to provide massive value to a logistic procurement world with my own platform. So I want to address a gigantic 2.4 trillion logistic market where is looking for a solution, source the pay using Excel yeah, and manual work to source and procure freight online. So at the end of this session, I will give you a short demo uh, of, our, of our platform. Yeah. At Chipster, <laughs> so at Chipster, we connect shippers and carriers to ensure a frictionless procurement process entirely online. So the inefficiency in logistic procurement brought me to the decision to build a platform to enable everyone in the world to procure freight online. So as simple as booking a hotel or passenger flight from Luxembourg to Paris. Together with my co-founders, we found the company in 2015, starting in a yeah, really small garage in, in Wasserbillig. So today we are more than 60 employees, all experts in logistics, more than 15 nationalities, the average age 31 years, and based with our headquarters here in Mertert at the port in Mertert. So the future will definitely see online platforms when enables a more efficient and cost-effective handling and procurement of shipments. So through direct link between shippers and logistics service providers, procurement, handling, transport capacities are optimized and freight co cost reduced. Especially in our business, the field of logistic procurement, so digitalization brings freight procurement to a next level. I want to make logistic procurement as easy as booking a hotel room for contract and spot buying. So for all mode of transport, road freight, air freight, and sea freight. So the vision was the basis for our product, for our data-driven e-procurement platform. Our product enables our clients to process logistic procurement without media break, entirely online, including all necessary features for the best possible benefit and reduce freight rates. So our digital e-procurement platform is our flagship product, so which is specially designed for large enterprises. And we are also launched, yeah, launched a low-touch solution, Ships to Go, for small and mid-sized companies. And later this year, we will launch also predictive freight matching platform with a clear objective to bring massive value to a carrier. So, <clears throat> yeah, as I said, we have turned a complex process into a standard solution that works across industries. So we have an enterprise first approach and are gaining industry leaders uh, as clients, all number one in their respective segment, in steel, in pharma, in chemical, construction, automotive industry, to name a few. And I think all, or, yeah, or you all ask yourself, why do all this enterprise decide to work with Shipster? So one, enterprise want to procure spot and contract buying, under one single platform without media break. Two, enterprise want to have full visibility and transparency in their global supply chain. And three, enterprise want to reduce their logistics costs and want to optimize their global supply chains. 
all the free using on single product, which is a platform. So in general, two essential criteria. First, process automatization on the one hand as a first step. Second, business intelligence on the other hand as a second step based on the massive amount, of course, of data. So I will give you a sense of, a, of our e-procurement platform, Ships of Legs, and especially our marketplace, Ships to Go, to show you in a live demo why the largest enterprises in the world are signing up for, for Shipster. Now to share. And this is the audience always a big, I would say, challenge that Christine is taking because going live demo during a webinar, you need to like to have a bit of risk. Of course, <laughs> that's really like the, the always the risk. But you can see now hopefully my screen, and that's the platform. So you find it under ships.go.com. You can easily, uh, yeah, procure your freight online for all modes, as I said, ocean freight, air freight, but road freight. So, for instance, if you do a, a transportation, or if you have a transportation need from Luxembourg, um, from Luxembourg. Let's say this uh, zip code to Hamburg, uh, Germany, Uppala, Hamburg, and to the port. You select the zip code, and then find rates. Then the next question or the next uh, stage will be asked Is it a full truck load? Is it less truck load? Do it simple right now. I need a box trailer uh, without dangerous goods. If you have dangerous goods, of course, you can uh, put your dangerous uh, number club. Clarification: You put the the uh, kilograms or so the cross weight from your truck into uh, the field, and then you select next. The next additional information will ask you: Okay, when do your your cargo is ready? So my cargo readiness is next Wednesday. I need at the latest a quotation from the market for my freight for water at by Monday at noon. It's okay. Here I can easily share some information uh, which is typically uh, also uh, shared via email but we want to stop this email tsunami and of course you can share your documents um, and packaging list for instance immediately also with your with your carriers and then the system is looking for for an, an, a provider for you so like on the left side you see all the carriers you can use and then for instance we said look we want to Ask the price from DHL and, and Kühne Nagel, but you can also use a digital freight forwarder. But of course, if your carriers are not registered and you want, would like to invite your carriers, then easily put the email address of your carriers in the field, add them, and after the registration from a carrier, he will also apply in your, in your selected supplier overview. And for next time, you can say, I would like to love to add my favorites as well from DHL and uh, Kühn und Nagel in this case, also Schenker in the loop here. And this means that next time, if you have a request for the same um, transportation service from Luxembourg to, to Hamburg, then it will be pre-selected the carriers on the right side already. And that's it. So. Then we, we procure a, a full truck, a box trailer, really in less as one minute. So it took me less as one minute, less as one minute, and to book a um, transportation service from Luxembourg to, to Hamburg. And under my request, you see all your requests you have. And then, for instance, like the um, go into after we received the quotations from the suppliers, in this case, it was from Luxembourg to Paris, the transportation service. Then you see the prices, but also the details and about lead time, waiting hours, all the elements you especially need, you can request and then say, good, I go, want to go now with the, with the cheapest one, with DHL, I select award. And then you receive an overview about, about um, the transportation service. And then you can confirm and that's it. 
So now DHL will receive the, the offer and can pick up the goods um, yeah, at, at requested next, uh, next Wednesday. Really easy to use. It's, yeah, it works uh, for all transport modes. And as I said, it took me less as one minute to procure an, an, an uh, transportation service from Luxembourg to Hamburg or to any kind of um, yeah, uh, destinations. And it takes also for ocean and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interest and attention. And I know, yeah. Now thank you. Thank, thank you, Christian. I think it's, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, an interesting approach and a combination here. And, and I want to come back to, uh, I think, um, I mean, we have already uh, still, I would say, interest in the audience. But before I leave the floor to the audience for the question, and now we get into the really interactive part of, 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 of the webinar. So again, the audience, feel free to continue posing questions. We're going to address them gradually. But I mean, uh, Chris, I mean, you, you clearly, I mean, uh, there was a statement from Stefan there around say one, there is no one solution for everything. And here what you're trying to do is actually taking the counterpart of that to say, I'm going to try to put one solution for at least the, the freight procurement, which is one of the procurement that company do. So what's your view on, uh, from a ship's point of view and your experience in trying to come to your customers and therefore in helping the suppliers basically customer relationship with one solution? Again, last thing that I was not hearing. Is um, you're coming to try to to solve the, to bring one solution to solve that problematic, and what what is the, what is your experience when you come to your suppliers that uh, need to handle multiple solutions? Do they in the end only use your solution? Or they will still be using several solutions. Yeah, of, of course. First of all, it's extremely important that you do it online, like a platform as we provide, or another solutions, of course, but. I think overall it's extremely important that you stay online because you need to play with the data you generate. And that's the massive value, especially the, 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 the platforms brings to you end. So it's it's extremely important from my point of view that you have no media break, that you that you go online, that you procure your freight online, everything what you need with your suppliers, and still take online, right? And hold not back into a media plate that you go into an Excel and that you start with uh, a kind of inefficiency. You need to stop your emails, your Excels, uh, tsunamis, and so on. This is, I think, it's an extremely important uh, thing. Okay, so the availability of the data in transparent between uh, basically the, the supplier and, and, and customer relationship. Uh, th thank you, Christian. Let's go now to, to the questions from the audience. I think we have already an uh, interesting set of questions coming up. And then I have also another poll for you in a moment. So, uh, first question to, uh, to Stefan. Um, Stefan, I mean, thanks for the presentation. Can you provide a few more details on your IDE in terms of priority changes and order revisions over time and how notification, etc., are being handled? Thanks. From Christoph Kell. Sure. So um, we, we are usually running an, an EDI run as well once a week. So we are not accepting live data exchange uh, every day because this needs to fit as well to, to the production schedule and as well to the production planning. So we are, we are allowing, allowing it uh, once, an update once, once per week. And as well, in addition, we are usually have a, a freeze of, it depends on the product, of a couple of weeks where, they, where the, the, the flexibility is given to the customer or to the supplier, let's say about 10 or 20%, it depends a bit. But for sure, there are strict rules behind. Um, uh, you, you cannot uh, order by 100% more by one week. So this is all dependent on, uh, on, the, on the lead times and also on the availability of the, of the raw materials. Thank you, Stefan. While you're on the speaking slot again, I mean, another question for you. Uh, do you have as well any predictive solutions that may present you what materials you may need to order to your suppliers based on temperature or not yet confirmed orders you have in your clients planning or your historical client supplier order data set? So here we really focus on predictive. 
So um, yeah, the answer is more or less already given on, on, the, on the question. So we're using all of them. So we are in the lucky situation that we are in the automotive industry where the, the, the forecast and the prediction what it's coming next um, is pretty accurate. So we are working for sure with, um, with booked orders we are not in the market that we are that we are on a on a build to order uh, situation so usually we are on scheduled agreements that we know pretty accurate what is coming in the next weeks and and months so in uh, and in addition um, as you might know as well on the on the component shortage there are long long lead times meanwhile up to a year of components and you have no idea how many cars will be sold in one year and 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 and, and later so it means we are basing on booked orders first then on schedule agreements, which are usually uh, up to three to four months uh, into the future. And uh, after that, we are going to a, to a forecast uh, provided by, by our customers. And this, we are turning immediately then as well in booked orders, scheduled agreements and forecast to our suppliers. I mean, just for linking basically also to presentation, I mean, do you, I mean, as IE use those, I mean, Platforms like like Shipsta, I mean Shipsta is for freight uh, aspect, but and logistics. But you have also for procurement of raw materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, do you use platforms, or you do do you do like you have shown primarily direct connection to your key suppliers on a on, a, on an ID point of view? So um, it, towards our our customers, uh, we ideally go in on XWorks so that we have nothing to do with uh, with transportation at all. Um, and on our, our supply, so supplier base, it's it's different. So actually, Chipster we are not using. Um, we are we are going mainly with big forwarders uh, to to stay on 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 one. So we're doing a benchmark, um, let's say twice a year to compare the, the cost and the prices. But usually, we're not changing a lot between the um, yeah the forwarders. Okay, but, but typically you now from your raw material, for instance, they would have also direct connection from a digital point of view. You would not necessarily go to procurement platforms for raw materials, just take that as an example. No, correct. Okay, thank you. So moving on, I mean, I'll, I'll go to Christian now and then I'll go back to you. Stefan, there is no question for you, but uh, uh, Christian, I mean, uh, your solution probably must offer APIs to fully integrate the no touch error selections. I mean, uh, and optimization. Right? Can you can you can you tell us a bit how in the end uh, you in plug digitally into the ecosystem of of the supplier and 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 of the customer because you are actually in between both. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So we 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 also act as a via API to our. Uh, enterprise clients uh, to the TMS system so that they are really an end-to-end -end process in place. Also to some other um, other uh, solutions, uh, market solutions, uh, especially like a freight audit or a freight settlement uh, uh, systems, which allows us to, you know, push the data without media print immediately into the operational systems. Like a TMS, this is the operational, like a SAP or Oracle, and of course, freight settlement, freight audit uh, um, solutions, so that you are really uh, uh, have no implementations and, and make sure that you are fully connected and integrated in the IT landscape of our clients. So we are providing like a REST API to our clients upfront as well. Thank you. Before we get to the next question, I think it's time also for, for the audience to continue to, uh, to, to, to have some, uh, I would say, oops, sorry, I thought I was further on my question side. But here is the next question for the audience, and, and the poll uh, will be uh, open soon, hopefully. I mean, uh, the, the question is, on your end, so dear audience, what is the biggest challenge preventing you to digitize more your supplier relationship? I mean, is it, I mean, as we have seen, it needs two to tango. I mean, uh, there is also you can you can you want you might want to digitize the whole uh, experience with uh, an interaction with your supplier, but they need also to participate to that. So, is it the fact that more the limitation comes from the supplier side? Um, is it the fact that my organization digital maturity is probably what prevents me to, to go further? I mean, we all have priorities and, and maturity there. It's about money. I mean, unfortunately, that is still. A big part of, of course, the game is it finding the right time, or is it the finding basically uh, finding the right skills and the partners to be able to do that? I mean, the, the poll should be is next coming up, so I'll ask my support team to.
please show the poll so that <coughs> the audience basically can uh, can interact. Otherwise, uh, we're going to go to the next question while the poll. Here is the poll, so please. So dear audience, so again, what is the biggest challenge preventing you to digitize more your supplier relationship? And and while the audience is, is actually answering that, let me uh, let me bring that first to Stefan, then to Christian. I mean, what prevents you to do it even more today? Stefan. So for me, the answer is clearly A, the supplier digital adaptation. So it depends uh, for sure also on the size of your supplier. And um, if you are dealing with, with smaller, smaller suppliers or which are may, maybe even out of a totally other um, their business area, um, then it's really hard to convince them to use uh, those digital tools. And um, that's for us the biggest, the biggest point and clear answer, a supplier digital adaptation. Thank you. Christian, yes, you're in the middle of the, of the two. So what, what would be your, uh, your, your ABCD? I totally agree with Stefan. So we have the same. So they convince them that they, you know, that they're using, using the platform, especially if you're going to the suppliers, especially also the mid size and the smaller one. It's, it's, it's really hard to and, and convince them that's the, I definitely agree and I would say A uh, as well. The supplier digital adoption, it's, uh, it's, it's the most relevant here. Thank you. I mean, we can see that also from the vote of the audience and that, that's the first one is definitely also the supplier adoption. I mean, again, coming back to a discussion we also had last, uh, last month about I mean, the customer relationship it is two to tango in the end. So you might have the biggest dreams of the world and the biggest capabilities and capacities. It needs also the other parts basically to, to do that. Now, if you deal with your supplier, you should be normally in the driving seat because you are the customer going back to the pond. But still, um, there might be an area where you can't force it more. Um, but we still have an interesting, the second one would be my organization, Digital Maturity, which shows again, I think um, one of the elements that was discussed earlier on, I mean, again, you, you shouldn't do everything in one go. It's about an element of going into stages, going in steps, not wanting actually to reinvent the whole world in, in one go. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. Moving back to, uh, to the questions again from, from the audience, um, the next one would be, uh, again, to, back to you, Stefan. You covered logistic channels. How do you manage data-driven feedback to improve your design process technology and pass data to your supplier. So that's again, passing with the data, the whole flow. Here, here by data, I mean time series of spectrum measures of users of your product by OEM and the end of the products. Pretty pointed question by clearly an expert, so. Yeah, so um, yeah, here, and also here the, the, the B2B platforms and the web interfaces are a pretty useful tool. So you can analyze your, your performance in the field, you can analyze your quality performance or even just uh, design, design change wishes by the OEM, for example, for integration of your products. And you are getting all this data back and you can analyze them. And then together with your, with your customer, um, you can decide on a change. So you drive this, we are the tool towards our internal process, our internal design, the changes will also apply to raw materials or for, for design changes at our supplier base and can be can transferred as well during those channels. So here the, the, the web channels and the, the B2B platform is a pretty good tool and database um, to analyze the performance and bring the improvements in, in place. If you are really talking about a complaint, you're doing the same. Then it will be an AD, for example, at your OEM, so at your end customer. You are working off your AD. You, did, you discover during the AD it's a, it's a, a supplier issue, and you start immediately the AD process uh, downwards the supply chain to, to, the, um, yeah, to, to the responsible supplier. I mean, picking back on that, I mean, it's about exchanging data in the end also between, uh, between yourself and your suppliers. I mean, I mean we hear a lot of of of, uh, of people not wanting to share because of people could steal the data, could do something wrong with it. So what's, what's your experience about data sharing in, aside from the te technological side? Uh, I mean, when you discuss with your supplier or, or even with your customer, I mean, what's the, what, what's really the approach? I mean, are people frightened to share data and they hide behind technology? Or, or more and more, uh, you can see that 
being part of one logistic chain in the end, it's key to share the data and people realize the importance of this. Um, indeed, um, this is one of the, the most discussed um, topic at all. So first of all, even your customer is sometimes not willing to be fully transparent. So he don't want that you know all his production data because he would like still to play a little bit with you to manage you by, 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 by ghost management. And the same is going downwards. For sure, what you're not doing, what, what we are not doing and most of the others not doing as well, you are not sharing on, on, on platforms, your, your IP, your, your, really your knowledge about it. But to keep the, to, uh, to bring the, the, um, the operational data into the systems, supports everybody and will help everybody to perform better and also to predict better. And that's also a point. And here again, the best example is COVID during the last uh, months. Um, even the, the OEMs were closing the factories. So the people left home to home, home office. They even uh, shut down their, their servers for two weeks. You had no idea at all what's coming up. So you had EDI data from three, week, three weeks ago. There was no update. You're, you're just running through the fog and you had no, no idea what's coming. And uh, if everybody understands that a trans transparency and a clear information flow uh, is important for the full supply chain and everybody keeps the rules, this will help everybody and will improve the system um, and, uh, and bring us a big, big step forward. For the Thank you, Stephen. I mean, Christian, I mean, on data sharing, I mean, clearly one thing is that you share your data with your supplier. Here you, <clears throat> you would have people sharing data with a platform, so they could see uh, probably with a, with a multiple fearing more exposure. What's, what's, a, what's your experience on? Yeah, I mean, the, experience, uh, uh, the experience, especially in the logistic world, is uh, nobody wants to, to share any kind of uh, freight rates, uh, uh, information and so on. So this is, this is clear. But, this is a process which will definitely change, uh, especially the platforms provide you the insights. And we are talking on the one hand, we are talking about process optimization, which is fine. You can easily use the platforms, you go digital, do everything. You reduce your cost or internal cost, and you bring massive uh, efficiency in the process. But what we are lacking and what we are missing, especially in the gigantic 2.4 trillion logistic market, is data, the data insights, right? that we can predict precise um, this, this information and is really wondering, and that was one of the elements why we're also starting the, the challenge with Shipstar was, um, if you book a flight from Luxembourg to Paris, you know what you pay, you know? If you book a hotel room in Paris or in Munich or in Berlin, you go on booking.com and you see immediately the price and you can easily compare the prices from hotel one to hotel uh, two and so on. And this is extremely important. And we see that the market is wake up and is willing more and more, right, to share that kind of data. And we need this because there's a lack of insights and that lack of insights make logistics procurement especially highly efficient. Yeah, and this is definitely what, what we are looking that we bring and open the, and the, the, the fragmented logistics world so that we gain insights and can do more efficiency our processes in the near future. So, I mean, <coughs> listening to both of you, so, I mean, before it was always, well, um, basically uh, not sharing data, meaning uh, is, is king, okay? So I don't share my data so I can remain the king. Would you say that now we have roughly in the B2B side start to change or would, when we were tipping the iceberg to say no? Now it's, it's sharing data means you will be successful. If you don't share your data at one point, I'm just going to bite you. De de definitely, as well, if I can start, Stefan, uh, definitely uh, really helps a lot. So we integrate already like a benchmark indication in the, in the, in the, in the transport mode, a sea freight. And now I show you a uh, road freight, which is of course more complicated due to the zip codes combination. But if you're talking about sea freight, there's a 60,000 ports combinations, right? So it's more easier to, to, to provide more insights on that. But if you go then online, and that dramatically change the, the process because if you already upfront knows what do you pay for your 20 foot container from Luxembourg to Shanghai, 
that make a complete different approach to your, to your work experience and especially on the process himself. So and we see definitely if we are anchoring as a, yeah, let's say the first, the enterprise first approach, we see that our clients are more and more willing to share uh, that kind of information data with others that they understood the benefit for himself, even if they share this information with the, with the market. So, Stefan, do you also see that now people, I mean, have, uh, have more tendency to share or they are still uh, kind of uh, in the old school trying, I mean, they will share what they, what they have to, but they will not share. I mean, by default, they will not share and then they will be forced to share a few things versus by default, I share, of course, bearing in mind that there are certain things of confidentiality, etc. but by default, it's more sharing mode or by default, it's still a, a protecting mode. Um, I, I think that this is this is uh, ju just now in the in, in the change. So I, I would uh, clearly say even two years ago it was by default a non-sharing mode. So definitely, if you if you need something, you had to ask for it, and it was really a small. You you, you just got what you really need, and um, this is okay. We shouldn't we shouldn't look at the positive things of the, the crisis we have right now, but this is something which was totally changed in the last two. Because the the, 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 the the customers and well as the suppliers, they understand now and they see the advantage of the prediction you need to do. And uh, the, the, the data sharing um, is getting more and more usual so that, that you no, don't need to fight for it. And what you have to say as well, but this is not just that the people don't want to share. It is sometimes also a company rule. Don't share more than you really need because they're all afraid of losing IPs. They're all afraid of losing critical data or that this could be shared maybe with another, uh, with a competitor or whatever. And uh, so, and if you have such a um, culture in your, in, your, in your company, means that, that the people are even more afraid. So even the data they are allowed to share, they, they will check twice before they are going to share it. But the good thing is this is going to change now, even up to the OEMs that they're getting more and more open to share their, their, their real data they are using for their work. Because you know what they're doing is they, they know just bring in a practical example. They need 1000 cars per day. They're building 1000 cars per day on, on one model. They will tell you they produce 2000. So what we, are going, what, what we are going to do, we are telling our suppliers we need 3,000 a day. And, 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 and we all in supply, supply chain knows what that means. And we see just now, and um, most of the Christian can, can also agree on that, we see the same in, in, the, in the transportation way. So everybody stopped everything last year. So it means one flight after the other got, got, got from the market. So the train stopped driving. So the, even the public transportation stopped. So now by a sudden, so the need is there. And it takes then the time to get everything up and running again. You cannot start from one day to another, 500 airplanes, just because they, you t take them out of the garage and send them to, to, to the sky. So everything needs somehow a planning behind. And this you can only do if you have data transparency and you have data not just from today, you cannot predict the data. So not only data is there for the transparency, but data is really needed to be able to predict and have the efficiency and play the annual role into the supply chain. Of course, the center we have here, what we call the industry, the production industry, but we have front and back into the flow. And in the end, it's the availability of the data as soon as you can, so that you can actually optimize your part of the process into, into the channel. Yeah. We have another question from the audience. I mean, to Stefan again, do you have a chance to get data of the full life of your equipment from your end customers? Probably we have some data pretty accurate on the market, since uh, this can enable you to do predictive maintenance and align your products to the reliability lifespan with your OEM products. Yeah, so um, I would say, we, as I said already before, we are in the automotive market, we are in the lucky situation, which are most probably not, not many other, um, in other, other markets like that. We have a pretty good visibility over the li volume of the lifetime. So for sure, this is just an estimation but the OEMs can predict pretty closely what they're going to sell on, on which car line. So they know today how many 
Golf, VW, how many Golf they will produce next year and uh, in 2023 and 2024. And um, for sure, this is um, a big advantage in, in this industry that we can exactly plan the maintenance, predictive maintenance on our equipment, that we can build up the capacities for over the next years, that we exactly know on which on which time frame we, we are going to exchange equipment because it's running end of life. So, yes, um, this is um, the advantage, and yes, this is possible. But, and again, as I said already in my presentation, there's always a but. If you're getting in a, in a situation like COVID, like component, component shortage, or even in a, in that, that the customer is developing <laughs> or selling a car, which is, is, is not asked on the market, then you are stuck because all what you're doing is pre-investment. You are pre-invest in the business. And if the business is not coming because um, this um, predicted numbers from the OEMs are not um, guaranteed. So you, you trust on it because they have pretty good experience and usually they are also fitting pretty well. But if there is somewhere a mismatch, we, we are in the pre-investment and that's then end of the day our problem. And again, we're going back. It's not only about the data of your customer or your data to your suppliers. It's actually even going further down. I mean, it's from your supplier and their suppliers to also have the data because there is a knock-on effect. And it's really in the instance about the transfer of the data as soon as it, is, it, is, it concerns you in what you have to do. That has value to you to actually do the best of or your, your, your part in, in, that whole, in that whole value creation. Um, what I hear also more and more, I mean, we speak about data, okay, uh, not going into the data is oil, et cetera, and the monetization of that. I'm going, more going into, to share data, there is an element of trust. So how do you bring that into, uh, we have three minutes to go, but how do you bring that into a relationship when you want to exchange? How do you bring the trust? There is technical side, okay, security, et cetera, but otherwise, is that something that where you see an opportunity for addressing and boosting further the data exchange to find ways to trust and bring trust into the system? Yeah, so um, I see the trust in the system by a restriction of the system. So this is now most probably exactly the, the opposite of what you was looking for. But what they're doing is we are putting systems in place and just make sure that nobody can see it, nobody can access it, only the one single person that really needs the data. So, um, and then end of the day, if you really drive this to the end, means again, then you can also send an email because then you have also just one single person who can access it. And uh, here, the, the, the trust is a kind of, a, of a, um, artific an artificial um, trust saying, yes, we trust you, you get all the data on, on our platform, but they are still restrict the access to the platform to an absolutely minimum. So it's then still difficult to, to get to the data. But they will tell you, you have everything you need, but you don't have access to it. So, and, um, but also here, I see a positive trend. So that it, let's say if I remember the first platforms we, we entered, then there was really a, a single name um, allowance. And meanwhile, we at least are ready to an organizational allowance. So it means, okay, if the develop, developer has access to it, it's not just his name, it is his team who has access to it. And uh, for sure, every single customer, or not every single, but some have even special security, say, um, uh, security rules you have to follow. Even that you are not allowed, just an example, that to, to run the data on the same server than, uh, than another customer. So that you have really an, 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 a technical barrier between, between the, the servers where the data are stored. I mean, thank you. I mean, time is, is, is flying and we're about to close here. So I just want to, to thank you. To thank you all. We have a few more questions and hopefully we can bring them in and have direct answer separately. Um, but I think what I hear clearly is that we are clearly at a turning point of sharing data between suppliers and customers. And that, is, that uh, the rule is starting, the tipping of the iceberg is being passed. That doesn't mean it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an easy flow. It doesn't mean it's going to be a, absolutely uh, uh, fluid uh, from the get-go, but at least we start to know that now the norm of the need and the norm for sharing is more there than the one of protecting data. 
and it comes, of course, with its own challenges uh, there. Um, I want to thank you both, of course, for for this uh, for this uh, for joining us today, um, and. Um, I want to close here to say we are discussing about data and the, the, in the next topic, which is about digitizing the production, so the core, the core of, of, of the industry, it's also an element where there is a lot of data being produced and a lot of data being shared. We spoke about predictive maintenance. We spoke about those kind of things. So it goes again, it's about sharing here the heart of, of your core business to the others. Um, in this case, you could say for Christian, it's a whole, the heart of the East engine and then and about the sharing and and from a from a from an IE it's, it's the whole production side so that's the topic for next time but thank you uh, Stefan thank you Christian for for joining us today and, and sharing your own experience about uh, the challenges and the benefits uh, of of uh, digitizing the the, the the supplier side with of course a key element about it's about transparency it's about trust it's about efficiency it's about choice, and again, it's about not one solution fits all, and it needs two to tango. So a lot of, of opportunities still to do even more and better. And I want to thank you, uh, both of you, Stefan and Christian, for, for joining me today. And thank you for the audience to be with us and for your interaction. And hopefully, uh, we can see you and we meet you again in a month from now, and uh, more focusing on the production digitization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody.